Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to try to introduce myself because if there's someone who's here who doesn't know me, you're not graduating. <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted that we have Dr. Richard Tapia and the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation over here. I'm thrilled that they were able to spend the day with us. STEM education and technology, as you all know much more than I do, is so important to each of us. We live with science and technology in our lives. Most of us would not be able to do things if we didn't know how to use a cell phone. And that tells us how inclusive and intrusive science and technology has become and how critical it is. And therefore, for all of us in this room today and for those who are not here, STEM education, the use of technology is extremely important. In fact, it is about the most important thing that we can make sure that every student has in addition to a liberal education. What is so important is not just that we talk about STEM, but that we recognize that the people sitting in this room are those who will be developing the technologies that will drive our world into the future. And it's important for us when we think about the technologies of the future that we also look at the great people who have made it possible in the past. With that, I'm just gonna welcome you all here I know that some of you have had a great day already, and I hope you'll have a great evening. So thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Andy Rathman Noonan. I'm the executive director of the National Science and Technology Medals Foundation. Um, I actually came to UT Arlington's campus a few months ago. And I had an opportunity to meet with a number of students on campus here. Um, and it was incredibly inspiring to sit with them, um, hear about their goals and interests. Uh, it was just a wonderful uh, trip for me. And, and simply put, it's, it's great to be back here on campus. Um, I want to add some quick thank yous here. Um, I want to first thank the UTA staff and leadership. Uh, you guys have been inter integral into putting together such a wonderful event. Um, I want to thank our agency sponsors, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, as well as the National Science Foundation. Um, it's their generous support that allow us to share evenings like this, as well as share it uh, with people across the country. Um, and of course, I want to thank my staff, um, Laura, Allison, and Ryan. They do a, a tremendous job. Uh, they are absolutely wonderful, and I, and I can't thank them enough for making this happen. Um, for some context here, uh, we began uh, our An Evening With program two years ago uh, because we wanted to create opportunities for students like all of you um, to having meaningful interactions with the top minds in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, we believe that these men and women um, have much to teach us beyond just the technical aspects of their work. Um, it's their stories of perseverance, achievement, and, and often failure that inspire us to set our sights higher and recognize our potential to achieve great things. Um, what we hope is that by the end of tonight, you come to appreciate that there isn't one way to be an innovator, one way to be a world changer. There's no predetermined path. It is through unique and diverse experiences that the great STEM leaders of our time discovered new approaches and developed incredible solutions to the world's greatest problems. In a few moments, you're gonna be hearing from a truly insp inspirational individual, Dr. Richard Tapia. Dr. Tapia is a mathematician and professor at Rice University where he also leads the Center for Excellence and Equity in Education. In 2011, Dr. Tapia received the National Medal of Science for his fundamental contributions in optimization theory and numerical analysis, and for his lifelong efforts to foster diversity and excellence in mathematics and science, in science education. We are honored to have him here tonight. Um, leading our conversation will be Dr. Minerva Cordero, a mathematics professor here at UT Arlington and a program director at the National Science Foundation, where she oversees uh, an effort to improve STEM education at Hispanic-serving institutions. She's gonna be our perfect guide tonight, uh, and we couldn't be happier that she's agreed to do this. So, if you'll please join me as we welcome to, our stage, uh, to the stage our honored guests, Dr. Richard Tapia and Dr. Minerva Cadero. Good evening, everyone. It is indeed a great honor for me to be sharing this evening with Dr. Richard Tapia. Dr. Tapia serves as a model 
for me and for many others of how he uses his successes, his accomplishments in mathematics, and translate those into ways to advocate for those students from underrepresented minorities who have not had the opportunities that they deserve because of who they are and because of the intelligence that they possess. So I am very, very thrilled to be here with Dr. Tapia. And I was said before, there was a meeting in January with some of our students, and our students share with us what questions they would like to ask Dr. Tapia. So we're gonna begin this evening by me going through some of those questions, and then we will open up the floor for our audience to ask questions of our invited speaker. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Good Tapia. Evening. <laughs> it's great to see you again. It's great to see you too. Uh, I want to start from the very beginning. Would you please tell us about your schooling? This is before college. Your elementary, high school, tell us what that experience was like. Sure, I'd love to. So my mother and father were from Mexico, from Mexico. My mother came at the age of 11. She was not alone, she had a 10 year old sister but nobody older than that. And her father sent her, she said, I know a place where you can really thrive in education. You're going through Los Angeles, okay? And she did, but they were with a distant uncle who didn't believe that women should be educated. So he told her, you're not going to school. He told my mother, you're gonna to go to work or you're gonna to have to clean the houses. So at the age of 12, she went and worked with a family. And she made sure that her younger sister one year younger, would go to high school. So my mother, who was indeed a remarkable woman, never went to middle school, never went to high school, okay? Almost the same story with my father. He came from Mexico too, and you know, he believed in education. In fact, my mother believed she came to the United States for education. So she was a model for, well, there were five of us, five children, a model for us to go forward in education. Not, here's what you should do and here's the thing, but believe. So if you had to say, I'll say two things about my mother. One is, she was the proudest woman in the world. And she, and she, you know, she believed that, she believed in the rainbow path and the pot of gold. If you just went one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time, you'd get to a good place without knowing the destination, without knowing where you were going, but just go forward, go forward, go forward, and something good will happen. And she used to tell us that. Okay. So I used to tell her, oh, come on, mom, that doesn't sound, that, that sounds kind of cheesy and crummy. But she said, no, you go, you go, you go, okay? And there's the other thing I want to share about her. She believed in si se puede. Yes, you can. Long before Cesar Chavez, I mean, way back before that, she was, si se puede, but she didn't, you know, always say si se puede. You can do it, you can do it. So she gave us the confidence to believe that we could. That's it, that's a crit critical thing. And so I have a sister that um, went to UCLA, my brother went to UCLA, my youngest brother Steve went to Yale, and so we all believed her path and went forward. But I grew up in Los Angeles. Now I didn't grow up exactly in the, um, I grew up in a poor part of town, but the part of town I grew in was not all Latino. It was mixed with a lot of different people and, and, and stuff. So the schools I went to were not good schools. I mean, they were the schools that were there. We were in a poor part of town, and they were there, okay? So I remember, I don't have terrible experiences. I mean, I was always good in math. The reason I even ended up in math was I was good in math. So here's what I tell you. I was the best student at a crummy school in mathematics, okay? <laughs> so the school was really crummy, okay? I mean, it really was a bad school. But I was the best, okay? So being the best in a little pond can still give you a lot of confidence, okay? So I knew I was smart, I'm not brilliant, I'm not a genius, I'm just kind of smart. So I went to school, and I went to school, and I went to high school. But here's the sad part in my life, is that I didn't have high school teachers directing me. They didn't say, oh, you're smart. See, you should go on to school, you should go to college. I didn't ever had anybody tell me that except my mother said we should go forward, but she didn't tell me how. So when I, you know, I, my twin brother and I fell in love with cars at a very early age, 10 years old. We bought a car at 10, started taking it apart, racing at 14, and by 16 we had national records. So 
what happened in terms of school is I didn't go to college out of high school right away. I went to work, to work on cars. And there was this person, his name was Jim, and he was from Mississippi. Richard, you're smart. Ah, somebody besides my mother said I'm smart, okay? <laughs> okay, J Jim, Richard, don't make my mistake. Don't just get, you know, wait till you have a bunch of kids, it'll be too late, go to school. So finally, after that whole summer, after I graduated, in September, I just said, okay, 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 and I went to community college, okay? I just went, and I signed up. Again, I was the best student in our community college. It wasn't a great community college, but here's the whole story. Two math professors, okay, and uh, they came to me, and Stuart Friedman was one of them, and the other one was Carl Fritz, and they said, you're really good. I am? Yeah. Go to UCLA. Okay, where is it? It's over there on the other side of town. Okay, I'm gonna go to UCLA, okay? So I could drive, so I went and I checked it out. When I got to UCLA, they said, how come you didn't come out of high school? You could have gotten in and you would have qualified for scholarships. Because nobody told me, nobody told me. But now all of a sudden, the community college professors were telling me, you're good, go to UCLA. And that's one of the, okay, so first Jim's statement about go to school, go to school was really important. But the community college professor is saying, go to UCLA, it's a good school and you're good. Okay, I believe it and I did. So how did it start? Now there's a long story and, and I'm gonna go back, but I mean, so I went from crummy schools, crummy schools to community college, but you know, there's a lot of ways to the same destination. Many paths to the same destination. I got to UCLA. I could have gone directly, but I got there indirectly. I went to work, I went to community college, I went a lot of places, and I got to UCLA. Now, was I a star? No, not at all. In fact, I was underprepared. Better. my mother's guidance was survival skills, not tutorial skills, and you know, survive. My mother survived. She came at the age of 11 by herself with her 10-year-old, and she survived in Los Angeles. So I said, I'm gonna survive at UCLA. I mean, when I got there and I saw that I was way in over my head, I'm going to survive. So the next thing was figure out how do I survive? I said, look, I've been good in math, but this place, there's a lot of really good people. So I'm not gonna take a whole bunch of math classes, and I'm not gonna take a whole bunch of hours. So instead of taking 16 hours or 17 like they wanted me to, I took 12. And I started to get a little bit better, and a little bit better. And I work harder, and I'd work harder. And then when I, I did well. I was mostly Bs and some As, and I was doing okay. And then, so how did I get into graduate school? I, I never thought I was good enough to go to graduate school. I said, look, I'm doing well. My mother, bless her soul, would have been happy if I had just graduated from high school because nobody in my family had graduated from high school. So she would have said, I'm the oldest, my twin brother and I. I'm happy you graduated from high school. UCLA was frosting on the cake. Bachelor's degree from UCLA. Oh, that's a lot of frosting on the cake, okay? So she would have been happy, okay? But there was no plan. You should get a PhD, you should do this. No, it was one step, one step, one step. And somewhere along that path, there's going to be a pot of gold. That's what she would say, okay? So how did I get to graduate school? I went, I was in a class, and I, I was pretty good. I, I wasn't a star. I mean, never been a star. But I had two friends. One was named Norm, and one was Wellington. And I was better than they were in the math class. And they came to me one day and said, I'm going to graduate school. We're going. And I said to them, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. <laughs> I said, you shouldn't go to graduate school. You're not good enough. And they said, well, we're going. And I said, but I'm better than you and I'm not going. <laughs> and then they said to me, well, maybe you should go. Ah, another new idea. Maybe I should go to graduate school, okay? So that's kind of called peer, peer evaluation. So I applied only to UCLA, didn't figure it out that I was, there's this school and that school, and I got in. So I went to graduate school. And then things got better and better and better. So I, I, I will say to this, 
my life has been starting at the bottom and going up. And I define that as happiness, okay? Unhappiness is starting at the top and going down, see? <laughs> and so here I am, you know, approaching 80 years old, and I'm still doing good things. The three best papers that I've written in my whole life were written in the last four years, okay? So, you know, we get better and better and better and better, okay? And that's essentially that. So back to your question, okay? I had no grand plans. There was no saying, you're gonna do this and you're gonna go to college and you're gonna do this. It was just a little bit at a time, accidentally. So a lot of things were accidental. I mean, I happened to end up at UCLA. I happened to go to a community college where two professors told me, you're really good. I am, are you sure? Yeah, okay, fine. Now I, I would be the best student, but I knew I was the best student in not particularly outstanding classes. Now, I was no longer the best student at UCLA, not in the first years, but I was, here's a, a key statement that I share with you. I'm not always the best, but I'm good enough. I was good enough to go through UCLA. I was good enough to get a PhD. I was good enough to get a faculty position. Was I the best? No. Did I have to be the best? No. Did bother? Good enough was really served me well. That's a wonderful, wonderful story, Richard. And so important for our students to realize that not everyone has a big plan yeah, yeah. and that we can get to the same destination following different yeah. pathways. That's and that's absolutely really important. Now, how about academia? When did you decide you wanted to go into academia? Okay, I didn't in the sense that... <laughs> okay. You know, there was... I was wandering around in the wilderness, okay, for 40 days and 40 nights at least, okay? <laughs> and I got a PhD, and there was one underrepresented minority faculty member at UCLA in mathematics. His name was David Sanchez. He comes up, usual tough. Tapia, what are you gonna do? I don't know, I'll get a job. Now, IBM supported me in um, graduate school. They paid my way through. And, and, and that was good. But he said, what are you gonna do? And I said, I don't know, I guess I'll go to work for IBM. And my wife was ready. I got married as a sophomore, okay? I had a daughter as a junior. So we were married for a long time, okay? And Sanchez said to me, have you ever considered being a professor? And I said, no. <laughs> don't you think you'd be a good teacher? No. Okay, do you want to be a professor? No, okay. <laughs> well, he said he and Lowell J. Page, who was the chair of the math department, got together and they came to me and they said, we've just talked to Barclay Rosser at the University of Wisconsin, one of the best places in the world in your area, and they're willing to offer you a postdoc. That's great. I went home, uh, by this time I had two kids. My wife, Jean. Jean. Pack, get the kids ready. We're going to Wisconsin, okay? okay? We're going to Wisconsin. I had never been out of California, okay? And I said, we had a 63 Chevy. It was not a low rider, it was just a 63 Chevy. We got the two kids, we, and we went to Madison, Wisconsin. And that may be the most critically important thing in my life. When I got to Madison, okay, two things happened, okay? One was good and one was bad. I'll give you the bad one first. We had rented a house, and everything was good, good. And the person who rented that house called UCLA to find out if we were Mexican, okay? Now, my wife is not. She's New Yorker, okay? New York with Puerto Rican. And they, found out that I, and they found out that I was Mexican, and they took away the house. We got there with no house. Two kids, no house. Real Mexican, okay? So, um, the university was so embarrassed. They found us a house immediately, and we moved in. And it was a great house, and everything was great. But the critical thing was, I was no longer a student. I was accepted by the best in the world as a colleague, as somebody to work with. So I got to the place, and, and I, I have another saying that I always say. If you sit on the porch with the big dogs, and you bark like a big dog, the world will see you as a big dog, okay? So I saw all these big, I mean, the, my heroes, people that I had read about, world-class mathematicians, and I said, I'm with the big dogs, so I better bark. 
So I started to bark, and I said, oh, I sound pretty damn good, OK? And, and, and then I, I, I had a hero named Michael Golom. He was at Purdue, and he was visiting Wisconsin. And he had a particular paper I liked. And I told him about his paper. And I said, but I have an idea on how to extend it. And he said, let's do it. So we wrote a paper together. So I was writing papers with the best people in the world. Okay? And that gave me a really good visibility. So Wisconsin was critical. I went from my crummy high school to community college to UCLA. And David Sanchez said to me, and the chair of the department, we're going to get you a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin. And we went. That was really, really important. It was really important that I was accepted by them as one of them, you see? In other words, I no longer had to, you know, people wouldn't vibe me and I wouldn't have to jump through hoops. You're one of us, okay? Fine. And it worked. And I wrote papers with people. And I wrote, uh, you know, a good number of papers. And I thought I, I knew how to work hard in Los Angeles, but that was California, and there were beaches, and there were things to do, and there was Hollywood, and the Sunset Strip, and you know, rock and roll, okay, and drag racing. In Madison, everybody worked. It was snow <laughs> and ice, okay? You just worked. No beaches. You didn't swim in the lakes. So I learned how to work. And all of a sudden, I was writing papers, and I got really uh, good visibility. And you know, that really gave me the fulcrum for Madison. So once I was at Madison, I worked with the big dogs. I wrote papers. When I left Madison, this was a long time ago, I had numerous job offers. They said, look, Richard Tapia has worked with really good people in Madison, Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin. So he must be good. He's already pre-filtered. That means they thought he was good enough. So we think he's good enough. So that took me to a really excellent position, an excellent position to say. And so I had job offers from 10 universities. Okay, so anyway, but Gina and I, Gina and I, now my wife's New Yorkian, Puerto Rican, okay? So she didn't grow up on tortillas, okay? Or menudo, but she loves them, okay? <laughs> so when we were in Madison, you couldn't find tortillas. See? And Jean said to me, Richard, we have to go back to the Southwest so we can have tortillas, OK? <laughs> I said, OK. California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. And then she said, but we've been in California. Let's try something else. All right, let's try Texas. Yeah, I've heard about Texas. Let's go to Texas, OK? Do they have good Mexican food? Yeah, they have good Mexican food, OK? <laughs> and we did. And we were just going to go there for a couple of years and then go back to California. Because UCLA had told me, look, if you go away for three years, we'll hire you back. But life was so exciting in Madison. And then we went to Texas. And we had to choose between going to the University of Texas in Austin and Rice in Houston. But my wife was a dancer. She was trained in New York City Ballet. So she wanted the big city for the opera, for the theater, for the dance and stuff. So we chose Houston and Rice over Austin and UT. And that's how we started. And that's how I got. Now, it turns out that it was an outstanding choice, but I didn't make it because I knew what I was doing. Okay? <laughs> I just did it, and it happened to work out. That happens a lot of times. You make a choice, and you say, it works out. So Rice has been good to us, and Houston and Texas have been good to us. Okay? But I often tell our president, like not long ago, David Libra, our president at Rice, he said, he and I sometimes argue a bit. And um, he said, we really treated you well. And I says, you have. But David, I've treated you better. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, maybe. <laughs> but, but, it, but it was a natural fit. Immediately, I started winning teaching awards and the students. And I get very uh, upset when people say, oh, you're really good with minority students. Okay? No, I want to say I'm really good with all students. Okay. Last year, I taught a class, a graduate class, with a lot of Chinese students. And they loved me. I mean, they'd come to my office and everything. And the Chinese students, at, uh, the Chinese faculty at Rice were too hard on the Chinese students. So they would come and you know, actually be part of my support group. And so let me just say that I accidentally got into academia. I did really well. And I was promoted very fast. 
and I got into those ranks, and things kept going better and better and better. But I didn't have any great plans, but it was the right choice. It was the right choice. It was a good choice, and in fact, I know back now, you know, what other job can I keep doing and keep working at the age that I'm at now, okay, and still getting good recognition and coming and speaking to such wonderful audiences as all of you. <laughs> Thank you. So certainly you have been um, in the balcony and you started as the little dog barking and they were yeah. bigger, bigger dogs than you. Yeah. But then eventually you passed most of those and you have done a tremendous amount of work. Of all of your mm -hmm. research contributions, which one do you consider to be the most significant? I don't have one paper. I have maybe the last paper I wrote, okay? I had a student that was in my class and I had an idea, and I said, I have this conjecture, mathematical conjecture. I think it's true, but I haven't worked on it. And his name is Iorio Coccola. He's from Italy. He said, I'm gonna work on it. And the next thing I know is we wrote a paper, and I brought in one of my ex-students, Richard Bird. And we, it was a classical result that hadn't been proved in, oh, I think the first time, it was from 1967, and we proved it. And the referees just loved it. I mean, last week we got a referee's report from two, and they said, they said, this very clever, beautiful way of doing things is new, is important, and must be published, okay? So that satisfaction, that beauty and that satisfaction, this was last week, and I looked at that, and I said, that's really beautiful. So my wife knows no mathematics, but I go and I'd shared it with her. And I said, look what's happened. And she, and she understands the value of that. And the paper before that was something <clears throat> that I had been working on for many, many years. And, it, and I had a friend named John Dennis who worked on it with me. And we had worked on it for like 25 years. And then we didn't finish. And I started a couple of years ago to finish it. And he said, Richard, we don't need that visibility anymore. You know, we both are known, and we don't need to finish this paper. He said, let's quote, let's punt, let's punt, let's quit. And I go, John, I can't do that. I don't do it for visibility. I have started, and I've learned from my mother, if I start, I'm going to finish. And so he said, well, I don't want to work on it. I don't, I, don't, I don't have the excitement. And I worked on it, and I worked on it, and we finished it and it was a great paper. So this is an optimization. And so the last three papers that I've done, granted, the ideas came from 20, 30 years ago, but I finished them right now. And so these classical results in optimization theory that had been open for a long time, okay, we, I did three of them with other people in the last four years. And the excitement that I get, the love. Now, my son's a musician, and he went to North Texas State. So he understands the passion and the, and the love. My daughter is, has a degree in English, and she'll tell me, Dad, do people love mathematics? I go, yeah, Becky, people love mathematics. Do you love mathematics? I love mathematics, Becky. I don't see how anybody can love mathematics, okay? I don't understand <laughs> okay. And she's, she's really good at her specialty is Shakespeare and literature. So anyway, that excitement continues. So I can bring, you know, towards the sunset years of my life with great excitement, and, and I teach class, okay? And I, I, you know, and the only criticism that I get when I teach, okay, here's what the criticism I get, okay? He tells too many stories. <laughs> he tells too many stories, okay? And so I tell the right students, I say, look, I've been around the world, and I'm going again, okay? And I've had a lot of experiences. So you could go read the textbook. It's my book, okay? But that's not gonna give you the things that are important. They're my stories that are important. When I was on the National Science Board, the things that I, Wisconsin, working with Barclay Rosser. I just, so I tell stories. Now nine out of 10 of the students like it. But some of the students who are really one dimensional, they go, well, we could learn more mathematics if you would stop telling stories, okay? And I said, well, I'm not gonna stop telling stories, okay? <laughs> That's my life. I'm gonna share with you. 
I'm going to share with you that life that you can't get out of the textbook. It's that life that I've lived, the good things and the bad things, okay? And we're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about, for example, here's what I'll do with the class. I'll ask the class um, something like, who is uh, Sid Burris? And they'll go, I don't know. I said, That's our dean. Oh, OK. OK. <laughs> who's who's uh, Mari Lynn Miranda? I don't know. That's our provost. How about um, David Libra? I think he's the president. OK. <laughs> and I said, how can you be so narrow? How can you not see what's happening? And then, you know, sometimes I'll ask him things about entertainers or singers, OK? Maybe Selena or maybe somebody from way back. And then finally, I get so upset, I ask him, look, raise your hand. How many of you have ever heard of Elvis Presley? OK? <laughs> and they'll go, OK, OK, OK. So at least we're not at level zero. OK, we're going to go forward, OK? <laughs> and I tell stories, and I tell stories. And at first, I used to worry that maybe I should be changing who I am. But it worked. It worked. And other professors would say, well, your style is not standard. How good? Isn't that good? But I, I won teaching awards. I twice won the all-university-wide teaching award. So it worked. It worked, it worked, and that's what I, I do. And um, I'm happy. I, I don't want to stop teaching. I don't want to teach a whole bunch of classes, but I don't want to stop teaching. And I love to talk to the students. And the biggest compliment I got about a year ago was an Indian student who was very, very good. He said, in your class, I feel that everybody's the same. It's not that some people are real good and some people are not good. We're all the same in your eyes. And I say, but you are. But you are. So that's what I want, is I don't want to say, oh, here's the star. Let's ask the star this question. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So anyway. That's very nice. Um, so you have mentioned in the different uh, answers that you've given several people that have been your mentors. Uh, some of them were your professors. And what do you think are the most important qualities of a good mentor? And my question as a second part, in the mentor-mentee relationship, both play a part, right? So for our students in Rear, what makes for a good mentee? And how can we maximize in that relationship of the mentor and the you mentee? Know, I didn't have a lot of mentors. I had David Sanchez, okay? and then. <laughs> But look, let's, let's call these two um, community college professors mentors, if you wish. But all they told me was, you're good, and you go, should go to UCLA. Okay? You're good, you should go. That wasn't a relationship that I went to their office and we talked a lot. So it was just them stepping forward and telling me, you should go to UCLA. So I consider that a mentor. Okay. Jim, when I was working in the muffler factory, you're smart. Go to school. David Sanchez, what are you doing? I don't know. Well, let's go to, uh, let's get you a job in academia. So there were just more people who said something at a critical point. I have a student named John Rodriguez who worked for Texas Instrument. And he was in my class. And I said, are you going to go to graduate school? And he said, no, because I'm not good enough and I didn't, I had some bad grades. And I said, but you are good enough, and don't worry about those bad grades, because they were in your first two years at Rice. He's from San Antonio. He's from uh, Barrio High School. And he went to graduate school, and he got a PhD, and he got out in three years. So I just stepped in with him and said, I think you should go to graduate school. Like my professors in community college said, I think you should go to UCLA. That was critical. Now, that's not the only way. But sometimes you don't have to do much. Just tell somebody, that was good. You did a good paper. You did it. Now, if you, now right now with, with the minority students at Rice, graduate students, I talk to them in STEM one on one at least every semester. And a lot of them say, I don't really communicate well with my advisor. Then I say, OK, well, get somebody else to be your mentor and talk to that other person. But if you're happy with the research you're doing with your advisor, then let's just go and get somebody else. Now, what do you choose in those positions? Somebody that you're comfortable with. Somebody that you can say, look, I don't feel comfortable about what I'm doing in this class. 
or this is too much, or I'm on it. Somebody that you can open up to, and you know that the person will trust you and care about what you do. If I have anything that I have for students, all of them, okay, is they believe that I care about their future. I believe that whatever I do, I will care about their future. And I call it tough love. I mean, I'll tell them, look, you're not doing this, or this is not working. It isn't. I often give talks to K-12 teachers, and I say, hugs and kisses are great, but they're not going to solve the problems, okay? Hugs and kisses are not going to solve the problem. So I'm pretty tough on these students, but I've had 20 women PhD students, 20 in mathematics. That's more than anybody in the country, okay? I get them out, and they go. I got a, a, a call last week from Christina Villalobos, who's interim chair of the math department, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And she says, I want to thank you for what you taught me. I want to thank you for how you nurtured me. I have seen other people here on the faculty and they hadn't been nurtured that way. So whatever you did for me was really, really good. Okay? Juan Mesa at the National Science Foundation, he'll say to me, well, whatever you did for me, that means I was their mentors, but I cared about them, I thought about them as people, and I thought, how was the fit? And we would talk one on one. But if I, if I thought something needed to be corrected or something needed to be fixed, I would say it. I would say it, okay? And that's the way I, you know, that's the way I am, and I think it worked with these students, okay? So in a mentor, someone that you see that you're comfortable with, someone that care, you feel cares about you and will lead you in positive directions, okay? Someone who cares. So I have all kinds of students who know that I care about them. And the full spectrum, okay? As I mentioned to you last year, it was a bunch of students from China, okay? And they would come to me all the time. And I spent a long time, one of my uh, best students two years ago was, his name, we called him Jimmy. His name wasn't Jimmy, but he was from China. And we spent a huge amount of time deciding where he should go to graduate school. And we considered this school, and then I would talk to people, and I'd talk, and we got it down between the University of Illinois and Georgia Tech. And then I, had, I brought in another faculty member. We tried Georgia Tech. So he's at Georgia Tech. But he's at Georgia Tech because we cared and we directed. So that's what I'm saying. To your question, someone that you know will care about your future and someone you're comfortable talking to. That's it. Very good. All right. One more question. Um, and you have mentioned along the way different, the path that you follow and some things that, for which you had not planned. When you, overlook, when you look at your career, what do you think has been the biggest challenge and how did you overcome that? Well, I haven't, I mean, as I started in mathematics, there's always the challenges that there's a real hot shots and they want to put you, I mean, math is a very, mathematics is a very elite area. And they want to say, you know, you're really not as good as you should be or you're not as good as I am or, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ego in mathematics, okay? So that stuff was not hard. That, that, that was not a challenge that was hard, okay? I would just say, okay, fine, you're wrong. You're wrong, I'm gonna do well, okay? Maybe I'm not as good. I tell my wife, who loves me, <laughs> but sometimes she tells me, here's what Jean says to me, okay, she's New Yorker. I always love you, but sometimes I don't like you. <laughs> okay. So I said, look, Professor A and B are much smarter than I am. Very Puerto Rican. You know, I bendito, okay? No, they're not. Yeah, Gene, you don't know. They are. So, you know, does that help me through it? Not really, but yeah. Now, the hardest things in my life, the adversities have been three things. Gene was a dancer. And we got married when I was a, uh, a sophomore. Our daughter, Cersei, was born as a junior. And Jean was a dancer. And she danced, when we, got, when we were married, she danced with companies in Los Angeles, OK? She was a good dancer. She was a good dancer, OK? But it, when Cersei started, Cersei started dancing at two or at three. And she got to be really good. She graduated 
from the High School for the Performing and Visual Arts in Houston as a star. And then she went to UCLA as a freshman. And she danced the lead role in the UCLA production. A freshman had never done that. But she said, look, dancing's not in college. I'm going to New York. I'm going to New York. And I'm going to dance with the ballet company there. And she did. But she came back to Houston and she told me, Dad, I was a big fish in a little pond. There are 500 girls in New York better than I am. I'm coming home. So she came home to go to Rice. But now let's go back to Jean. So here's the adversity I dealt with. So in 1977, Jean, who had a studio teaching 450 students, teaching 21 classes a year, 20, I mean a week, a week. And she would teach and teach. In 77, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, okay? To a wheelchair, 79 myasthenia gravis, sell the studio, okay? 77, 79, 82, Cersei was killed in an automobile accident. Jean says, life's over. I give up. Three strikes. And I convinced her, you still have something to give. You still have something to give. You can teach people in wheelchairs. So she started a program called Coming Back, and she taught people in wheelchairs. And she got on national TV, and she won national awards, and she was on the home show, and, and in fact, on TV. So she came back. But she wanted to die. She said, it's over for me. There's nothing left, OK? So the things that are hardest for me to deal with, if I close my eyes and think about it, they're not mathematical. They're not mathematical. Gene, multiple sclerosis, wheelchair. Cersei's death, OK? Those are the hardest things to deal with. And those are the ones that could just break you. But going back to my mother, You've got to move, you've got to go forward, you can't let it stop. So when I give commencement addresses, I, I gave the commencement address last May at Harvey Mudd, okay? I tell students, look, dream, all of you, dream of the future, dream of the wonderful things that you want and the things that can, you can accomplish. But if they don't all happen according to plan, don't stop, don't stop. Everybody can handle success. Learn how to handle adversity, okay? Don't stop in the eyes and face of, diversity, of adversity. So that's what I say in the graduation thing. Dream, and if everything goes the way you want it, so be it, that's beautiful. But if it doesn't, don't stop, adapt. So our life has had to adapt with Jeannie in the wheelchair. She was in the hospital in December for three weeks because of the multiple sclerosis, okay? We had to adapt. I mean, not a day in my life goes by where I don't think about Cersei. She was killed in an automobile accident while she was a student at Rice and she was on the way home, okay? So those are the things that I deal with. So much different than the mathematics. I mean, to me, when Cersei was killed, I think, let's see, I had just won some big award or a bunch of it. And, you know, Jean had her studio. And she had um, multiple sclerosis. And Jean said, I'll take multiple sclerosis a hundred times over just to have Cersei back. And I said, I'll give the National Medal of Science back. I'll give, I was the first Hispanic elected to National Academy of Engineering. Okay? I won the Vannevar Bush Award, the only Hispanic. Okay? I'll give all those back if I can have Cersei back, but I can't. I can't. I can't, but she's there. So the challenges that I've had in my life, they're not mathematical. I mean, sure, there's hard mathematics and stuff, but mathematics is fun and you go forward and sometimes you do good things and sometimes you don't, but things just got better. So this page says all the successes, okay? And that's a, a lot of stuff. This page says all the failures and adversity and there's a lot of stuff. They're both part of me. They're both part of me. So I have to share with you this side and that side. It didn't always go right. And Gina and I talked late at night about the things that went right and the things that went wrong. And as soon as I get back tomorrow, she's gonna say, was the trip worth it? That's what she always says. Was your trip worth it? Okay, 
yes, it was. Then she'll say, what was it? And I'll say, well, one of the things was Bob Woods and the race cars. That was outstanding. <laughs> and the other thing will be looking at all your faces right now and saying, what a beautiful audience. And then she'll say, you enjoyed it. And I'll say, yes. So, Wonderful. Well, I have one last question. Would you share with us some of your non-academic interests? Car, cars. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, I, I remember today at lunch I asked this question. So I'm going to ask you because I'm going to give a talk April 2nd at Rice, and I'm going to ask this question. So, okay, non-academic answers. My twin brother Bobby and I just grew up with a passion for cars. Now I think it's because we were socially awkward. We didn't know how to talk to girls. We didn't know how to go to dances. We couldn't dance. So it was really easy to retreat to just working on cars at 11 years old, at 12, OK? So always a first passion is cars. That's why I got so excited today with Bob Woods and that stuff. It, was, it hit in the center of my heart, in el fondo del corazón, right there, bam, OK? So I've always had that love, and in fact, after Cersei um, was killed, Gene and I went back to cars, and I built a car called Heavy Metal, and it was three times national champion. Three times national champion. And we showed it all over the United States. One of my fondest memories is, now the, the most knowledgeable audiences, okay, in the country, clearly Detroit. Detroit audiences for car shows, they know everything. It doesn't matter what color they are, what age they are, they know it. So we went and showed our car <coughs> at um, Detroit show. And what Randy, who built our car in, in Houston, he would pull it with a trailer. And Gina and I would go, we'd fly. We'd take an airplane and then go, and she was in the wheelchair. But what really fond memory I have is pushing Jean to the car show in her wheelchair in the snow in Detroit, Michigan. And Jean was laughing, and I was laughing, and she was in the wheelchair, and it was snowing. And, but we could get through. So we think back of that time. And if you, you, know, if you Google my name, you'll see there's a, a, a video of the Detroit show, and it's Amber Getz on Hub, uh, Hub Garage. And it's a, it's a great little video. I'm saying. But we went, and we went to California. Joseph C. Fuentes was um, Rice undergraduate in math and art, and he did the graphics on our car. And he went with us to California. And so we went there. Lots of car activity. So I would do that. But I also strong support of Jean and her dance. Okay? Whenever, um, whenever Jean had to do some dancing or something, uh, I would build bars, put up bars and stuff, and she had a studio. In Madison, Wisconsin, in the house that we had, it was a beautiful house. It belonged to Hans Schneider, the mathematician. And in this house, they had a basement. And I put up the bars, and she turned it into a studio. It was really beautiful, OK? And um, they had a ping pong table in the middle, OK? And so after the kids had gone to bed, Jean and I would play ping pong, OK? <laughs> it was strip ping pong, OK? <laughs> and Jean always lost, OK? <laughs> But she was a dancer, and I think that she wanted to lose because she was so proud of how slim and trim she was, OK? Those are good memories, OK? Those are good memories. But so my support of Gene, our son Richard, who does music, OK, and my support of him. I used to take the Rice graduate students, and they played underground stuff in Houston. Okay? He had a, a band called Flesh Mop, and it was heavy underground. So I'd ask people, you want to go hear Richard? And we had a following that you wouldn't believe who they were. And Christina from, um, from Argentina. And, and we'd, we'd go to a Mexican restaurant, and then we'd go hear Richard's gig, OK? And it was heavy stuff, OK? And I'd ask professors who were visiting, you want to go with us or you want to stay home, OK? And uh, I remember Florian Potra once. He, I said, we're, this is heavy metal music, heavy stuff. He goes, I saw the dead Kennedys. I, of course I want to go, OK? <laughs> so we'd go, OK? So support Richard. Then Becky, great singer. Becky would sing with mariachis. With, you know. Now, the, the f thing there is that she couldn't speak Spanish, but she could sing perfectly in Spanish, OK? 
like kukurukuku paloma. She knew it perfect. <laughs> she didn't know what the words were, but she would sing it with the right passion. And then I'd tell her, she'd say, Dad, what does this say? And I'd say, oh, it says this. And you go, oh, so sad, oh, so sad. She says, all these songs are about somebody being dumped or somebody dumping somebody else. <laughs> so a big part of my life has been support of my wife and my children on their activities, okay? A big part of my life, Gene and I turned to the 70 Chevelle heavy metal. If you Google heavy metal, you'll see all about this fantastic car. That was a part of our life that we decided to do after Cersei had been killed. And I needed a time period to come back, okay? So those are the things. You know, do I need cars anymore? Not really. And Jean said, I'm writing two books. And Jean says to me, can't we build another car? And I go, no, I don't have the time. And I said, and anyway, it costs too much. It costs a lot of money. Okay, these are, these are hard cars. I mean, I had in that 70 Chevelle maybe a third of a million dollars, okay? And I told, now this is, this is good for you, see? So I tell Jean, anyway, we don't have the money. She says, but we can sell the house, okay? We'll sell the house, okay? <laughs> so, so, so I'll tell you a, a, a sort of a, <laughs> my version of a Cheech and Chong story, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I grew up in Los Angeles, of cars, and so you would have a lot of people build really expensive lowriders. And so I have a friend who's an executive at uh, a computer company. I, I won't mention him, but sure I will. His name is Hector Reese, okay? <laughs> and, um, and he is married to a woman who is not Latina. And he picked me up in Austin to go to a restaurant in a really beautiful Ferrari. And I said, Hector, this is a beautiful car. And he said, yeah, my wife thinks I don't need it, okay? <laughs> now, he's Mexican-American. So I said, Hector, I'm gonna tell you something, okay? You have to tell your wife this thing, okay? Here's the way I believe. No Mexican-American can be self-respecting unless the car is worth more than their house, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I said, look, go tell Judy, you know, this car is not worth your house. Oh, no, 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 the house is worth, you know, millions, okay? Tell Judy that the car is, you know, you're still behind. You've got to get more, okay? <laughs> and, and so Jean buys into that, even though she's New York. And Richard, can't we build another car? Can't we do it? Jean, it's too much money. Okay, we'll sell the house. Okay, no, I mean, no, I don't have the time. So there's a... One of the things that I share with all of you, okay, I would never be bored in my life. There's never a way that I could be bored. I mean, if somebody tells me they're bored, I say, how can that be? I have too many things to do, okay? And uh, that's it. That, that's exactly right. <laughs> what do you say we open the floor now for our students or mm -hmm. our audience, anyone from our audience to ask questions? I know there's some microphones going around, so if you would please, okay? Do we have a question over there? Right there is a hand raised right here in the middle. So what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry. What kind of car he drives? What kind of car do you I drive? have a 78 Datsun 280Z that I drive on weekends, and it has very low mileage. It's probably the cleanest Datsun 78 280Z <laughs> in the United States, okay? I bought it, I bought it for $10,000. And I've had recent offers as high as 60000 for it. But Gene says, that's one of our children. Are you going to sell? <laughs> okay, are you going to sell a child? And I go, no. So I drive that Datsun on weekends. Now, during the week, I drive a handicapped accessible van. It's rear entry. I bought it in Michigan. See, side entry, you know, is too hard. But in Michigan, they build rear entry. So I went to Michigan. I said to the University of Michigan, invite me to give a talk. Okay. Give a talk, okay? Then I went around Michigan looking for these vans, and I bought, found one, and I bought it, okay? And so that's what I drive most of the time, because if I have to take Gene someplace, it's got to be this accessible van, okay? Now, you know, I have this toy, and we'll never get rid of that Z, because Gene looks at it and says, you know, it's, it's like fine jewelry or junk. So I feel good having it there, even if I don't drive it every day, okay? So there's a part of me that just gets very excited when I see something um, unusual. And I, it doesn't have to be a new car. I mean, to me, I'm old, so the car should be old too, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Back there? 
on the left. Yes? What do you think is important when trying to lead or empower others to accomplish a goal? I didn't understand the question. Did you yeah, hear? I didn't get it. Oh. What, what do you think is important when you're trying to lead others to accomplish a goal? Like, what kind of leadership qualities do you think is important? Okay, so you're asking me, okay, so the, the person there, you might repeat that if you heard it well. Did you hear it well? Somebody who heard it well, I think I understood what things, but I want somebody to repeat it for all of us so, so I can. So, was the question, what do you consider important in someone to lead someone else, to mentor them? To yeah, what, what do you think is important? Like, what's a good leadership quality to have in order to lead others to accomplish, like, one goal? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question because I'm on my chapter 14 in my book, and, I, and it's entitled Leadership, okay? And there's many, many types of leadership. You know, for example, um, David Blackwell, who is the most distinguished African-American mathematician this country's ever produced, okay? He died in 2010, but no doubt, the most distinguished African-American mathematician. So when I gave my talk at Berkeley, I gave a talk at Berkeley, okay? And I gave a lot of talks there. But at Berkeley, I decided that the title of my talk would be, Why Berkeley Math Would Never Hire Me, okay? <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I did. I gave Why Berkeley Math Would Never Hire Me. And the who's who of Berkeley were in the front row. Everybody, you know, the presidents and Carl Pister and everybody. And so I started this big discussion back and forth. And people say, no, we would. No, we wouldn't. Yeah, we would. OK, we wouldn't. So anyway, but, but here's what happened. OK, so after the talk, David Blackwell was there. And David Blackwell went to Berkeley in 1955. And he was turned down in 1942. But he came to me real quietly. And he said, Richard, I wish I could have said the things that you said today. But it wouldn't have been effective in my day. I couldn't have done it. So I really thank you for what you said. And I said, David, don't ever apologize for not giving the leadership that you want to. Because you gave us the most beautiful thing of all time. You showed us that excellence comes in many colors. You showed us that excellence comes in all colors. Okay? So that was leadership. So David did just research. But it was leadership. Now, some other people don't do the research, but they give other programs. So we need all kinds of leaders. But I do believe that you see success when the students react to what you're doing. Now, and I said to you earlier that I'm kind of tough on the students, OK? Maybe not tough enough. Maybe I am. But they react well. So the leadership that I give works, OK? And, and you know. so I'd say the characteristics that you look in a leader have to do with many different things, OK? Are you a person? that works with students well and motivates them. See, for years, for years, I said, I don't want to work with high school kids. I just said, that's like babysitting, OK? I don't want to work with high school kids. So my center, we do undergraduates and graduates. But then three years ago, we started the thing called the Tapia Camps with high school kids. And they was wonderful, OK? And all of a sudden, I started doing things and leadership in K-12. And at the end of the week, we would have your rose and your thorn. You would stand up and say, here's my rose for the week, or here's my thorn. OK, the good thing and the bad. And how many high school kids say, the rose for the week was meeting Richard Tapia and seeing the things he had done and knowing that I can do things like that. So it was really important. And I had been wrong all these years of not working with K-12. I had been wrong. So you adapt to the position and the type that you have to do. And, and so there are certain things, you know, I, I guess I could be a president of a university. I mean, maybe. I don't want to be, okay, or a provost. That's a very important leadership job. But that, I, I want to be underrepresented minority who happens to do good mathematics. So instead, what I say to my students is, I don't want you to be a professional minority, I want you to be a mathematician who happens to be a professional minority. Okay? And that's what I'm trying to do. I want people to say, well, Richard Tapia grew up in very humble settings and we did mathematics and did good mathematics and won the National Medal of Science and won other awards. So I want that legacy to live on. Okay? That's what I want to do. And I did that by design. I said, I want people to say, look, 
Somebody born and raised in America from modest settings has won the National Medal of Science. Okay? I was the first Latino in the country to, win the, uh, to be elected to the National Academy of Engineering. That's good. That's good. That's good. Very good. Other questions? There's one there and a couple in here. I will judge you by your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tapia, you left out one aspect of your life where you helped a lot of us out, and that is the number of students you convinced Rice University to take back in the 70s when they weren't accepting Hispanic students, really. Minerva, I don't, I didn't. We couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Dr. Tapia, you left out one aspect of your life back at Rice, and that is the number of students you convinced Rice University to take when they were not accepting Hispanic students in the 70s. Oh, the 70s. Well, I mean, look, in 19... <laughs> and we just want to say thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in Aww, 1965, Rice said for whites only. I mean, so see, when I talk about... Cal I'm California and I'm Texas, okay? I live longer in Texas, okay? But I'm not a, a Tejano. I mean, you have to be born in Texas to be a Tejano, okay? I'm California, okay? But you know, I'm you know maybe Sali because of Selena and Freddie Fender, I say okay maybe I want to be Texas, but I'll tell you. So here's what I say about the racism in Texas versus the racism in California. Okay, Rice University is incredibly racist. You know, up to 1965, <laughs> up to 1965 when they had to break the charter to integrate because it said for whites only from Harris County and Texas. Okay, it never said no more women. It just said white only. Now, white only really meant no blacks and no Hispanics. Because in the 50s, there was this, a, 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 a thing about an Asian male from San Francisco applying to Rice. And they said, oh, what that's whites only. But the admissions committee said, no, 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 no. We accept all kinds of whites, OK? And this Asian, <laughs> and this Asian is white, OK? <laughs> What they were saying was no blacks and no browns, okay? And so we always had Asians in there. But see, here's what I was going to say about Texas, okay? So this is the mathematical statement. If you look at the constant term, okay, okay, and then there's other terms that grow, okay, or either decline. But in Texas, the constant term is really large, okay? You know, like the other day on the TV, I heard Guy Lewis at University of Houston was the first coach to use black players, okay? But that's in the South, because when I was at UCLA in the 60s, there were all kinds of black players. So that was Texas. That was Texas. So Texas has a large constant term, OK? But the derivatives are all positive. They're going in the right direction. So things are improving. Even though they started so awful, awful, they're improving, OK? Now, California doesn't have a large constant term. But it's not clear where the derivatives are going. It could be going negative, OK? So, Oh, I mean, I take great pride in how Rice went from extremely racist to what it is right now. The engineering freshman class at Rice is 27% Asian American and 27% Hispanic American, okay? So we've made great strides. Have we on the faculty? No. Have we in graduate school? No, okay? You know, and those are the battles that I fight. But I played a major role in changing the undergraduate admissions. I was in the admissions committee for eight years, eight years. And I would tell them, here's what we need to do, and stuff, and things like that. So I take great pride in Texas going from really, really bad to improvement. And I'm very confused about what's happening in California right now. Boom. That's it. Anyway, thank you. Very good. Was there another question over here? Does Houston or San Antonio have better Mexican food? I'm sorry, what was the question? Does Houston or San Antonio have better Mexican food? Oh, that's an excellent question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, 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 is no, there is no doubt that Mi Tierra in San Antonio is probably the most visible Mexican restaurant in the country, okay? And it's got mariachis, and it's got a bar, and it's got all kinds of stuff to buy, and it's got murals and everything. But does it have the best Mexican food? No, okay, no. It, it's got good Mexican food, and I like to go to Mi Tierra all the time and other restaurants. 
But I'm going to argue that I can give you three restaurants in Houston that are the best, okay? And, and when, <laughs> when Sonia Nazario, who wrote Enrique's Journey, who she's from Los Angeles, she came to visit at Rice, I took her to my favorite Mexican restaurant, and she says, okay, Richard, you win. When you come back to Los Angeles, I'll take you to eat, but I'm not taking you to a Mexican restaurant, okay? <laughs> so, you know, everybody kind of said, but I really have a couple places in Houston that I would put against any place in the country, okay? Yeah. Anyway, but San Antonio has got enough good places, okay? <laughs> good. Was there another question? Where's the mic? There's someone who has a question here who needs a mic right here in front. Thank you. Good evening. I would like to ask um, if you have any advice for people who study for exams and midterms, what, what advice would you give us? Don't cram, don't cram. <laughs> see, <laughs> see Rice students all come and they made it through high school by just studying the night before. And you can tell them, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. And in my classes, you know, I give them some hard assignments and some hard exams. I give very hard exams. It's called the Caltech approach. It's called the Caltech approach. I'm a hard grade, uh, I mean, I give hard exams, but I'm an easy grader, okay? So, okay. now at UCLA once, I had an undergraduate class in algebra from a person who got his PhD at Caltech. And I got 11 out of 100 on the final. And so I went really meekly to the professor. I says, I guess I failed your exam and I'm gonna fail your class. And he goes, what'd you get? I said, I got 11. Oh, the highest in the class was 12. So you get an A. <laughs> <laughs> so my exams are hard. And my exams are, are really hard. And I tell them, you're not going to cram. You're just not going to learn the material in the last week. You have to prepare for it. And so the person who got the highest on the exam in my class I just taught, he wasn't by f the best student necessarily, but he, he really did a good job. And I asked him in front of everybody, what did you do? And he said, well, I had some extra time, like two weeks, and I just studied everything we had done and went back. And the other people who you know, were perhaps better students, they all tried to do it within two days and stuff. So my, get away from high school. Get away from high school. Graduate school at a good university, undergraduate school, is more challenging. Get away from high school and start saying, I'm not gonna cram things. I'm not gonna do things at the last minute. I end up doing things sometimes on papers, you know, towards deadlines. But the thing is, you say, look, I'm going to expand the way I understand and I do things. And then you just look at it and you say, that's really quality. It's not the grade. It's not the grade. It's, you know, my students will say, we learned so much in your class, okay? But in a graduate class, I give them all A's. I mean, they get all A's. I say, look, you're not competing for A's, maybe for A pluses, but just you're competing for understanding, okay? And so that's a mature attitude. That's what I learned in Wisconsin. It isn't just, you know, a grade or a number of papers. It's really that understanding. You can look back and you go, that is beautiful. That is so wonderful. And I understand things so well. That's maturity. Other question in the back? Hello, um, I'm here with my 11 year old son, uh, son, so I have a question and he want me to ask a question. So my question, or will be on my comment, well, what question, what's your recommendation for is keeping your math skills up during the summertime? He's 11 also. So I just wanna know what'll be like the recommendation for is keeping the math skills up through the summertime. And then my son's question is, what type of uh, STEM camp would you recommend? Oh, I don't have any specific recommendations on, on, on that. I mean, that's too detailed, okay? I think that you and your son have to look at what fits you best, okay? You know, I've been very excited by the camps that we do, uh, but they're, they're for eighth graders, ninth graders, 10th graders, and seniors. But, so I don't have a specific say this or that. All I say is look at it, talk to your son, and work out what fits you best. Okay, and, and, and that's you. But I like the fact that the camps that we have, the Tapia camps, they're taught by, they're, they're, they're project-directed learning.
but they're taught by people who are research mathematicians who know the applications, who know the theory, and do stuff. So that makes me feel good. If I look at the credentials of the people teaching our class, I say, good, good. As a sidebar, my wife used to get upset when, when a parent would start to say to her, show me why my daughter should come to your dance class. And my wife would just get upset. And I said, Gene, that's a good question to ask. You have to tell them that you studied in New York. You studied under Belichine. That's what they want to hear. Well, they don't have to hear that. No, they do. They do. So that's what I say with that. What was the first part of the question? She had a first part. Yeah, it was about advice for how do you keep the math skills up in the summer? Because when the kids are out of school for so many months, then they don't yeah, well, practice. To me, I don't think you're going to lose the math skills. I think it's much more for those of us, and I include myself in that, who are behind, use the summer to catch up and go forward, okay? I don't think you're going to lose the skills as much as you need to use the summer to step forward and go ahead of where you have been and catch, if you're not up to the best in the class, catch it up. So that means that you have to somehow start doing some math training, math work, and step forward. I don't like the fact that we take that big a block, but not because you forget it, but because it puts us behind, mm -hmm. further behind. Mm -hmm. Karen. And that's, that's real. And we're already behind. Anybody that thinks that underrepresented minorities are on par out of K-12, they ought to look at the data. We're not. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, one more question. Hmm. Here in the front, we need a mic. Um, what was the happiest moment in your life? <laughs> Just one. <laughs> I mean, you can tell us all of them. How about if I say your question, okay? <laughs> um, I get a lot of happiness out of my children or my wife's successes, okay? So when Becky would sing with mariachis and get featured like she sang at the outdoor theater in Houston. That was good. When my son would do various gigs, that was good. When Gene was on national TV, that made me happy, okay? Now, I'd say for my own self, it'd be the National Medal of Science. See, to walk into the, the White House, okay? And my daughter Becky, dear Becky, okay, she never is gonna be impressed with anything. Becky's never gonna be impressed with anything. Now Richard, on the other hand, he started talking to the Marine Corps band, and so he was already impressed, okay? <laughs> but you walk into the White House, and they have two you know, sets of guards, and you get in, and then you sit down, so I'll tell you this story. And at this time, um, a woman came out and said, President Obama does not like you to yell, and he doesn't like small talk, so don't yell. That gives you, yeah. You know. And he came out. And Jean, my New Yorkian wife, just yelled at the top of her lungs. She was screaming and everything, okay? And so President Obama, he looked at me as to say, that's your wife. And I looked back at him and I'd say, that's my wife, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and it was good. And then Jean said, after, you knew I was going to yell. And I said, yeah, I knew you were going to yell. Okay. <laughs> and he said, I, he said, she said, my side won. I had to yell. Okay. And it's not like that. But to sit there and you sit in and you say, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, and they play hail to the chief. If you grow up in this country, that's an incredible moment. Then President Obama came out and said, here's his first statement. He says, all seven of you have done great research. But Richard Tapia has given in the direction of the nation that makes it a healthier nation. He's improved representation of underrepresented minorities and he's improved representation of women. So I wish the other six of you would emulate what he's done, okay? That was an incredibly happy moment. And so I told my son later, I think somebody wrote that. And Richard says, I'm not sure. I think President Obama did it himself, okay? And it doesn't matter because he took seven of the best scientists in the world and said, I wish you would emulate what Richard Tapia has done. That was present. That, from a scientific point of view, that qualifies as as happy a moment as any. 
being in the White House, receiving that award. And it kind of made me feel, I've made it. I'm no longer back of the bus. I'm now in the front of the bus, okay? Maybe I'm even driving the bus. <laughs> That's a good question. I've been looking at you all night. I, 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 I all, see, I always pick a face, and some people hate my talk, so I don't look at them, okay? <laughs> then some people like them, and I look at them, or some people I watch to see how they go. But I always pick, even if there's 5,000 people in the audience, okay. and I'll pick somebody, okay? And always try somebody to get good vibes from, okay? And they are. So I've been watching you. <laughs> I know some of you came to hear him speak. Maybe some of you came to eat free food and get swag. But as long as you're here, we're happy. So please, go outside, continue your conversations. Dr. Tapia and Dr. Uh, Minerva will come out there as well. Um, and please enjoy yourselves. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>